Welcome to today's South South News program. I'm Bill Miller. The main purpose of South South News is to focus attention on some very unique economic, social, and developmental activities that are helping to create a better world, especially in developing countries. Today, we're going to focus on food security. Obviously, food security is very important to developing countries as well as developed countries. We all need food to survive. My guest today is from Malawi, and this is a country that has taken the lead in really working towards improving the food security situation in, in that particular country and throughout Africa. The Honorable Brian Bowler is the permanent representative from Malawi to the United Nations in New York. His Excellency, Excellency Ambassador Bowler is someone who has a tremendous amount of knowledge in this particular area. Ambassador Bowler, welcome to today's South South program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's talk a little bit about food security. When I think of food <clears throat> security, I think of, first off, having available food, but also having access, having sufficient amounts of food, but also having access to that. And we've seen the statistics that something like every day, 900, over 900 million people do not have sufficient food to eat. Periodically, there are over 2 billion out of the 6.7 billion people on the face of the earth who go hungry. And this is really a tragedy, but the experts say there is enough food there for all of us. What is the situation? First off, tell us a little bit about Malawi, the conditions in Malawi, maybe how large the country is, the population, and some of the creative things that you're doing to focus attention on food security. Well, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, uh, it's a great honor to talk with you this morning on such an important subject as food security. Uh, we in Malawi believe there's no security and this is food security. Um, <clears throat> it has not always been this case for Malawi. As you know, the Malawi is the least developed country. And at the moment, uh, we are, have a president, his name is Dr. Professor Bingu Wamtalika, and he came into government in 2004. And allow me just to take you a little bit back uh, to the situation in 2004, uh, which will lead into what we feel is part of our success story or the, what we call the Malawi miracle. Uh, in 2004, I was the ambassador to the European Union in Brussels. And the challenge at that time, we were trying to feed, or the world was trying to feed, lots of parts of Africa, and we were trying to feed three million people in Malawi in 2004. Uh, when my president came to Brussels to uh, meet up with the European Union, we had agreed and pledged that that would be the last time we'd be asking for food support. And the reason we did that is because we were going to come up with some radical reforms in our food security policies. And this included subsidies. As you're aware, uh, most of the European farmers receive very large subsidies, as well as the American farmers. Yet, the challenge were, were that there was a barefoot woman, African woman, with a baby on her back, a hoe on her hand, and the West had a problem in subsidizing this lady or this old man. Yet, in the West, farmers using mechanized machinery would be well subsidized. So against most policies, our country took the brave step, including against policies of very serious Brentwood Institutes, and decided to subsidize the woman or the farmer in Malawi. <clears throat> that was the first year things changed. We came up with what we call the fertilizer subsidy program and deliberate targeted inputs into subsidizing farmers. The first year in 2004, 2005, we had a bumper crop of over 1.8 million tons excess food. In fact, we were able to share food with our neighbors. And we saw that we, against the best will of our advisors, came up with a program which we believe now can be borrowed on in far farmer subsidies. And that was the beginning of the Africa or the Malawi miracle. Wonderful. How did this fertilizer subsidy program work? Did you just pay for fertilizer or did you underwrite the expenses for that or was there more to it than, than just that one particular product? No, we talked about farm inputs in, com in, in, in com the complete package. First of all, getting fertilizers to the vulnerable groups or the farmers in Malawi originally was very, very expensive. And most farmers could not afford to farm uh, are using fertilizers. And the government, because we have donor funding and some of our budgets are supported by the donors, were not in favor of us having subsidies uh, to, fer to subsidize our farmers. Yet in the West, uh, farmers are fully subsidized. And some farmers are even paid not to farm. The luxury is there. So we as a government decided that we were going to do our policies 
use whatever resources we had and subsidize these farmers by reducing the costs and making fertilizer affordable, as well as targeted farm inputs. Not only was this one of the uh, uh, winning formulas that we had to use, but we also had to bring deliberate government policies uh, of walking the walk. In 2003, in the Maputo Declaration, African leaders agreed that they would at least contribute 10% of their budget to agriculture. Malawi went and, of course, also maintained 6% growth in agriculture. But Malawi went and did, actually did the walk the walk, and we talked the talk, and we contributed 14% and maintained over 6% development in agriculture. And the results were there. So we had the fertilizer subsidies, we had the target inputs, and we had the deliberate government policy, which was fulfilled by Malawi. And what we felt was an example to the rest of Africa that if we had deliberate policies, because whilst you've got fertilizer subsidies coming in without accompanying policies to make sure the fertilizer is available, the farm inputs are available, and also involve the private sector to bring a business-like approach uh, to farming, uh, that was the winning formula which we in Malawi employed. But ultimately, uh, the brainchild, uh, the mastermind behind all this was His Excellency, my president, Dr. Bingo Amtalika, who was determined, I mean, he knows the UN systems very well, and the Brentwood <laughs> Institute. So he was determined to go what he believed was right. He, be he was determined to go against their advice and say, look, I'm going to do what we want. He believes, and we believe as a country, that as a head of state, you have very eloquent ministers around you. You have the civil service around you. And Malawi, in this case even Africa, we know what our problems are. We really don't need consultants from wherever they will be coming from to come explain our problems. And if that is the case, that we do need them, then maybe there's a, another problem we should be considering. But we were very adamant in fulfilling our own destiny. And it's interesting, you mentioned about the developed countries who were coming in to offer advice. <clears throat> and in many cases, they were offering advice which was absolutely contrary, contrary, 180 degrees opposed to what they actually do in their own particular countries. Yeah. And so that is very important to focus on that. Malawi is about, I think, about 118,000 square kilometers. You have approximately, what, 14 million people? Is that correct? Something yes, like that? that's about, very correct. About the size of Pennsylvania, the state yes. of Pennsylvania in the United yeah. States. How is Malawi divided? Is, what part of that is arable land? What can be used for farming? And what are some of your major products? What are your agricultural products in, in yeah. Malawi? <clears throat> but just coming to your first point on, uh, I would not go as strong as saying the hypocrisy about it, but also the conflict in ideologies, was that generally speaking, which we are very grateful, and we remain grateful to the donor partners in the community at large for working with Malawi during its toughest and most daring times, and we call upon the support to still be there. But the challenging points was that some of the countries we work with, when they do want to give you some assistance, the definition of assistance would be production or procurement of commodities in their own country, and then shipping to the, the vulnerable states through their own infrastructure. And by the time that commodity, which would probably cost 50 cents a kilo in that particular country where it's coming from, arrives at the destination, it could be costing five, six times. So your aid package is really financing some kind of uh, uh, economic drive back home. But ultimately, the infrastructure in any country, we do have uh, the truck systems or the railway infrastructure. The average truck in Africa carries 30 ton, that's 30,000 kilograms. So if you are t transporting 10, 15, 20,000 kilograms, you can imagine what percentage of your national fleet is boarded off to do logistics to respond to a crisis, which leaves the rest of the infrastructure and the fleet very little work to do in, in exporting commodities. And in case in Malawi's case, we are one of the world's largest tobacco growers. We grow burley. And of course, uh, we're also very, very big in tea, and we're huge in, uh, in sugar. We export a lot of sugar to the European Union and throughout the world, including America. And uh, we're predominantly an agriculture producing uh, country. But interesting in the, in the statistic, the statistic you're asking about the, num the amount of percentage use, Africa, it is rumored or said that we only use 8% of the African good land to grow the crops. Now, whilst we are able to produce our crops, the greater challenge which remains today in producing our crops is the storage of our commodity. You may imagine are the challenges which we face through the, the weather patterns of the world. But once you produce the commodity, 40% of our crop is lost through post-harvest storage. Now, in the West, it's approximately 1% of the crop is lost. So you work hard, 
and you lose 40% of your crop through the storage system. So we as a country are working vigorously in looking at having silos, metallic silos, strategically positioned throughout the country. But also on a continental level, uh, maybe in, a, in another time we can discuss that, but on the continental level, we are looking that the continent should have strategic grain reserves positioned throughout the continent. 